Hello all and welcome to the Brooklyn Rails 250th new social environment. I'm Anya Bernstein, a production assistant at the rail and I have the pleasure and privilege of being your MC today for a conversation between Jackie Nickerson and Charlotte Kent. We are, we are also thrilled to have the poet Jasmine Kortz here who will read uh, to close today's program. So to begin, I ask you to join us in acknowledging uh, the Wappinger, Canarsie, Muncie, and Lenny Lenape people of the Delaware Nation and Shinnecock Indian Nation, the traditional owners of Lenape Hoking, the unceded land and waters on which we stand. We recognize that white settler colonialism um, is part of the continual legacies of white supremacy, which has many contemporary expressions. We honor the memory of those that have lost their lives and to those that are working to undo this legacy of violence and injustice. And we acknowledge that justice will come from the streets, from the nation demanding accountability until Black Lives Matter in the eyes of the state. Uh, please check the chat for a living document of resources and actions. And before we introduce our uh, guest and host, I'd like to begin with a brief moment of silence. Thank you. And now to introduce today's uh, guest and host. So Jackie Nickerson began uh, photographing Zimbabwean farm workers in 1996 as a way to change the perception that those who work in African agriculture are disempowered on modern people. The resulting series, Farm, focused on the unique and beautiful clothing the workers made for themselves. And by doing so highlighted the workers' identity, individuality, and ultimately their modernism. For her most recent series, Field Test, Nickerson questions the life choices of the people of this world and reflects a contemporary reality in which the autonomous human subject is a compromised, problematic entity. Nickerson's photo sculptures dismantle and reconstruct, protect and destroy the individual human being. Field Test is a further elaboration on Nickerson's longtime interest in how people inhabit, experience and impact uh, on the world around them and how their circumstances shape and define their lives. Nickerson divides her time between London and rural Ireland. Uh, she is represented by Jack Shaman Gallery in New York. And our host, Charlotte Kent, is an assistant professor of visual culture and an arts writer. So without further ado, Charlotte, please take it away. Thank you, Anya, and thank you, Brooklyn Rail and everyone. Um, Jackie, thank you so much for joining us to talk about um, the new book and the exhibit currently at Shaneman Gallery, um, Field Test. There is so much for us to discuss um, in the list of topics that have come up around this body of work. Uh, I'm just going to name some of them. I don't even know how we'll get to all of them, but globalization, technology and medicine, commercialization, mass production, environmental pollution, migration, digitization, fake news, pandemics. And of course, I want to ask you so much about your practice and this particular set of photographs and how you've been making them. So with that, I can't have us wait any longer. Um, if we could go to the first slide. Um, this body of work in the image that sort of introduced it, and then in this image called isolation, seems so much as if it has to do with the moment that we're all living through around um, this pandemic and the isolation that we've been experiencing. But these images started long before that. So could you tell us a little bit about where they came from and how you found yourself here with them? Um, yes, first I want to say it's a pleasure to be here and thank you to Brooklyn Rail for inviting me. Thank you, Anya, for the introduction and Charlotte. I'm just so, so, so happy to be talking to you. Um, yeah, I, I, I mean, it's, uh, I think that the timing of this whole series is a little bit of a fluke that it came out or it was planned to come out. Um, just when the pandemic was getting into its stride, that the COVID, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. And, um, but really the series um, has its roots in, um, uh, from, goes back to like 2014, um, when I was in Liberia for Time Magazine, I was doing some portraits out there. And, um, uh, and I was very um, taken by the, um, how PPE worked in, uh, 
on, on a human level because you know everybody was in very heavy PPE and masks, um, and it was necessary, you know, medically. But uh, it was it was also quite difficult for patients to deal with the fact that they they weren't dealing with people that they could see as being recognized as being you know personalities and human beings um and there was uh so it sort of had a negative psychological effect on um on them on their healing on their relationships with the people around them and so i started thinking about all the other unseen things that we have in our lives that also have a negative psychological effect and uh and that was really the beginning of the series yeah yeah i mean it's as as the audience will see as we go through these images plastics are going to be this recurring theme and i mean here in wrapped right it's sort of um it, it's sort of made explicit but i wonder if um given this notion of you know thinking about the unseen and like unseen psychological impact and so forth. You might just talk a little bit to us about the title and your choice to call this field test mm. as, a, you know, as the collection. Yeah, um, well, field test is, is, an, is a, it's an eye examination. And what it does, it's, um, it tests your peripheral vision so that you get a scientific measurement of how much you can see as opposed to how much you think you see. So I thought that was an interesting kind of um, way of describing this this whole uh, this whole theme, really. Um, yeah, you know, I mean, I suppose all artists have have have, have that sort of dilemma of um, you know they see something, you know, painters, sculptors, people in all kinds of um, all kinds of uh, you know who who work with in all kinds of mediums, um, and it's about translating your your ideas or your vision into something, you know, with photography, because there's always kind of this literal side to it, not that it's always used like that. Mm -hmm. um, and that is sort of traditionally the way that I've been, I've always sort of worked in the real world. So I wanted to do a series that didn't really come from that place. It came from a place where I could control all the content, control every single element of um all the imagery so that it wasn't a negotiation anymore because you know like in portraiture there's a lot of negotiation and all of that so i wanted to not do that in this um so that's why i i started um to um yeah thinking and thinking of things in a more sort of conceptual way what in what way do you think that this notion we all have that we see things so much more than we actually can um how how did you begin to develop a narrative around that right i mean part of it is i, I mean i'm looking at this you know image in particular wrapped right mm -hmm. and it is on one level a very simple image um and then the longer that you look at it and i got a chance to see it in the gallery and it's full size which we'll talk about in a bit suddenly all these details start cropping up, right? There's a sense that there's a shoe there. Um, the black tape actually almost seems like a hand that's holding the, the pink wrap down, which then suddenly reminds one that tape is actually like a prosthetic hand, right? What is tape doing but holding something down um, that someone would potentially hold down otherwise? Uh, there's the sense of this person huddled under there, which inevitably brings up the question, why are they huddled under there? Um, and then one of the things that for me was really remarkable was that it's completely wrapped, it's called wrapped, but then um, for the audience, if you look quite carefully, you'll see that there's just this tip of a hand that's peeking up over um, what would be the hand area that's holding the pink down and just that little bit of a hand outside of this wrapped figure then produces this whole other sort of like what's going on and you know i'm just wondering can you tell us a little bit about how you began to imagine these images to tell to get people to start thinking some of this stuff about how they don't see what they think they see hmm. um well after, after i came back from this is in 2014 after i came back from liberia 
um, I actually started making sculpture. You know, I'd been collecting lots of materials all the way for years and years and years. And, um, you know, I remember even when I was like a little kid, like eight and nine years old, I'd put junk on my walls. I'd take the labels off, you know, like orange juice cans and things like that. And, my, and I used to go down to local jumble sales and spend my pocket money on um, like netting petticoats and I put them up on my wall. And uh, I, remember, I remembered all of that. And I thought, oh, wouldn't it be good to start from that place, start from a place of like, there being like no human element at all and just using materials to try and get to a, the place that I, that I want to go. Um, but I knew that I wanted to work with certain kinds of materials that I've been collecting and um, which were mostly artificial materials. And, um, and the more and more, so I started out, you know, doing the sculpture and then I did some quite literal, um, experiments with like groups of people wrapping groups of people in like big plastic things uh, we did things like um i vacuum packed somebody literally um you know we did some crazy things to try and get to the extreme end of of like what what it was to be immobile but the more the series went on the more I kept thinking about it was um the more we kind of acquiesced to uh all the unseen things that are happening in our lives, but are, are going to have a huge impact, if not today, then in the future. Mm -hmm. um, things like genome editing, things like the power of social media, the things like ownership of software that we put all our inf personal information into and all of that. So I, I knew that I had to bring the human element back in. So luckily, I started working well the first person I started working with was my uh, video, video editor Carolina um, and uh, she's an artist herself she's a painter as well and um, so she kind of got where I was coming from and she was incredibly patient and we tried so that's when I started to like build things around uh, a single person so that's really that was really the beginning of it. With this one blue green um, it's it has some of that that disturbing element where suddenly you see the hand in the lower part, right? Um, but it also speaks really a lot in particular to the plastics. And, and just before we move on to some of the issues around technology and um, environment, I think plastics is a particularly good place for us to start because it leads directly through into those. Um, and this image, it strongly evokes the layers of plastic of our lives and in which we're cloaked. Um, for the audience I'll share, I asked uh, Jackie if she would share with me uh, the list of materials, the list of plastics that she used for this project um, because I wanted, to, I wanted to read it aloud to you because you know plastics is such a huge topic for our time and the plastics in this body of work are very important. Um, and she said to me, oh, well, it, it'll take me a little while to put it together. And I thought, oh, sure, you know, going back through and like finding all the items. But um, no, in due course, I got a seven page single space document that was not complete. So I will not read all of those for you. Um, but I'm going to read a small list of them uh, because I think it. I think the names profoundly evoke some, some of what this image captures. Um, so give me just a moment. Uh, poly, polythene, polystyrene, cellulose acetate, vinyl lidine chloride, polyvinyl chloride, polyethylene terephthalate, high density polyethylene, low density polyethylene, PVC coated polyester mesh, polyethylene coated cloth, synthetic jersey mesh, nylon micro mesh, self-adhesive polyvinyl chloride material, polyester films, polycarbon films, vinyl sheets, plexiglass, acrylic, carbon fiber reinforced polymer, knitted polyethylene shade netting, and the list goes on. Um, I think one of the things that so struck me as I was going through the list, Jackie, and one of the reasons I'm grateful you pulled what you did uh, together, is that we don't, 
it's until you see this kind of list, until you see this kind of image, it's easy for plastic just to be one thing, for it just to be this problem of plastic, right? And not to recognize the enormous variety of plastics that we're producing and that we're using in, in the world everywhere. And I know that was a huge part of what you saw um, back in 2014 and that many of us have confronted in the last year. Um, in the context of the last year, of course, the plastics are also there as a protective layer, right? right. Um, and I found myself thinking, you know, between the medical stuff and then of course there is, you know, because of some of the work you've done in fashion, like thinking it must be that there's this material interest you have, but I understand you've always been interested in plastics? Always been interested. Um, I mean, on the one hand, it's kind of a, an interesting, well, you know, my brother's in industrial design, you know, so, you know, we talk about it a lot and he's got, I mean, we've got a I've got a real interest in how things are made for a practical use. So, for example, if you look at Ikea, if you buy, you know, if you buy, a, say, an item one year, the next year you buy the same item and the year after you buy the same item, which I've done, <laughs> and you can see how they've fine tuned every single thing in that, how they've made something thinner, how they've reduced the amount of screws, how they've changed the packaging to make it more compact um, because, you know, that's all the economy of scale. They can do that and they can make a lot more money that, you know, that's a, they can make a lot more profit. So, you know, I've, all, I've, always, I've always had an interest in that. I mean, specifically plastic, you know, and especially since 2014, I mean, I've always, I've always, it's, it's just, you know, somebody said to me, oh, well, it's just a cool material. So, you know, anything is cool. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a problematic material, but it's also something that is ubiquitous, you know, so, uh, for example, in this image, it, there's a sort of, uh, there's sort of two stories going on, you know, um, overall, um, I wanted to sort of address the idea of the Gaia in the Pacific, you know, it's this huge sort of um, area of, of uh, plastic in the ocean. It's not plastic isn't the only problem in the ocean, you know, there's like the sand pollution, there's lots of other things going on. I mean, I'm not an expert, you know, but I just, you know, throughout this whole series, I just want to address things that I think we're all kind of like worried about. There's this underlying like stress, this underlying kind of niggle about, you know, what's really going on. And so in this image, I wanted to sort of create the top half of it is kind of the ocean and the bottom half of it is, um, has got the, the PPE in it. And so, you know, um, plastic has a duality, it saves lives. It also destroys lives, it destroys, um, you know, the natural world. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, there's lots of those kinds of things going on in images all the way through the series, you know. In fact, in the next image, I mean, one of the reasons I was so interested in it is um, the way in which you balance out these different parts of it. You know, it, it's very hard. I mean, how, how do I say this? It's very hard to simply become judgmental in looking through these images, right? Uh, it provokes us to think about some of the issues you're addressing. And yet, how can you simply say, I will reject all plastics when there is also that PPE element there in the lower image. And in this image, um, cloud, there's, it, you know, again, it evokes so many things So that sense for, for whatever reason, for me, it evoked a sense of, you know, the scientist looking into a, um, a microscope, right? Like the cloud is somehow microscope. <laughs> um, but it's also this sort of sense of all that we emit, right? Um, and there's humor there too, right? There's a sense of um, not only because it's called cloud, but lightness. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, I know from speaking with you, every single thing in this image is sourced, mm -hmm. right? So I'm wondering how, as you're negotiating the materials, which you know have these complex histories, do you retain a sense of lightness so that it isn't didactic? Yeah, I I hope so. You know, I mean, you, you're dealing with like, 
issues that you know we all hopefully we were all thinking about um and there's, there's different ways of dealing with that you know this is my way of dealing with it my way of trying to you know start a conversation about what's going on um however you can do that is however you can do it i mean um there, there is like there is a, there is a bit of humor you know in the pictures um i don't think it should be take it tells itself too seriously you know as, as long as people start talking about it and saying why is that like that and why is you know why is her head in that huge bit of plastic what does it mean um i suppose that's that's sort of doing my job really um you know literally there 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 were like um thousands of images to to pick from you know so it's you know when we came down to the final edit because you know four years is a long time to be taking pictures um, so you, I, I think, you know, when it comes down to the edit, you just got to, it's just, you just got to have like a nice mix of things that contain the materials and the elements that you, you hopefully will get your point across, but hopefully sort of tell the, tell the story, you know, and, um, so like in, in this particular image, you know, uh, yeah, I mean, the, the green thing is kind of like a baby's bib um that we got it was like a sort of um a multiple use um plastic baby's bib she's wearing work pants she's got the work boots on actually they're construction boots and we steal toe caps um and then she's got this huge plastic which is a cloud um it's really i mean it's got so i was thinking about a couple of things uh, i was thinking that it's got to do with how uh, our kids are vulnerable to like air pollution and how in our cities it's getting more and more um, but more ominously uh, it's more about the the cloud the, where we put all our data and all our information because I think like going forward there's going to be ownership problems with that there's going to be copyright problems with that mm -hmm. and I think one of the things that I wanted to address in this whole series was accountability and um, the lack of accountability and regulation in like a lot of technologies as we're like moving forward, you know, um, who's who's overseeing that? Who's who's like who's who's you know who's looking out for us? Um, are we going to be able to have a fully democratic conversation about how we should be move, moving forward um, with that? So. Yeah, um, not to get too like serious. About no, no, it. I mean, it is serious. And in fact, in you the know. next image, um, you, you uh, seed tray, I believe. Yeah, um, I mean, it is in some ways speaks to that even more because of seed trays are very much about generation and about trying to prepare the next. Yeah. Right. But at and about, time, yeah, and about sort of feeding how we're going to, how, how is our food going to be grown going forward? You know, I think that. Um, gene editing is is really can, is maybe great, but it may also be incredibly problematic. Um, gene editing is when um, it's not like cloning something; it's like it's like um, splitting a gene from a species and taking something bad out, and um, hopefully solving something. So, for example, you know, if like you get potato blight, you're able to take the gene out that causes the potatoes to get the blight um what's problematic is that you know the agriculture industry nobody's regulating it um and they're also talking about using wild plants to start using this technology so that people can start e eating wild things and they're also talking about doing it on animals which they've already started to do so for example if uh you know, uh, so like, say, pigs have respiratory problems. Um, traditionally, um, they can take the gene out to stop them having that. And you think, well, that's a great thing. But the reason why they're having those problems is the way that they're kept. So why not just change the way that, that you know, they're intensively farmed and solve that problem instead of like or altering the gene? We're going to get to a world where they use the word themselves, selective breeding is really going to um you know take over and, and this but on the other hand you know there's positive things so that you know if you do re reduce things like you know um uh, potato blight and things like that if you do you don't need to use you know chemicals so much you don't need to use fertilizers so much you know you can become much more organic um it's like it's a it's a conversation 
Mm -hmm. I mean, it's interesting though, because the first genetically modified organism was 50 years, it was patented in 1972. Um, but of course, it was in 2018 that there, I believe it was two fetus twins who, um, it was the first CRISPR technology used on them, which actually got the world's scientific community to sort of come around to the idea of like, no, no, this we no more of this until we've thought about it a little bit more. Um, of course, no one knows if that's true, uh, but certainly it did have that reaction. It is something we have to think about um, as we worry about food scarcity uh, we do need to think about how to use land. On the other hand, on the other hand, you how are we using oh, land? This is, <laughs> this is a good example, actually, because on the other hand, um, if you think about um, greenhouse gas emissions, um, if you t if we stop using fossil fuels, which is takes up three quarters of greenhouse emissions, and please, I'm not an expert. Okay, I'm just interested. Okay, so, but if you take out three quarters of greenhouse um, of um, fossil fuels. Um, already food supply chain uses up a quarter, is responsible for a quarter of all greenhouse emissions. So if you take fossil fuels out, you know, food is going to be the biggest producer of greenhouse emissions. And the big, biggest, by far the biggest part of that is how we grow protein. So if you think about something like, um, I think it's, beef, if you think about beef, which is the biggest producer of uh, greenhouse gases, in the food chain, um, for one kilogram of beef, I think it takes 40, it is responsible for 40 kilo, uh, kilograms of emissions. Whereas if you, you know, you think about pulses, you know, lentils and beans and all that sort of thing, it's less than one kilogram for every one kilogram produced. So you can see, and then on the other end of that, you know, you've got, you'd need like a, about a half the amount of land. If you, if, if everybody went vegan in the world, we'd need half the amount of agricultural land than we need right now. And then it would also stop the land clearances and everything that's going on. You know, it would be like a dream and a really <laughs> incredible thing. Um, but that's also the, that's another way of thinking about the, the, the thing about how we're going to move forward with food, you know, um, so there are choices and lots of different questions. I mean, I think that's the, the thing across this entire series is this sense of choices. And um, with this image, I mean, I'm glad we got to talk a little bit about land and we'll have to talk about it again. I mean, there's a couple of things in this image I want to ask about. I mean, many of the images that are in on display at Jack Shaman Gallery are studio images. Um, and there's only a few that are location uh, oriented. If we could just go back to the previous image just for a little bit longer. Um, I'm just wondering how, like for an image like this, why was it important for you to do it on location? Because I can, I, I can imagine this image. It has some of the same feet. If you just look at the figure, it has some of the same feel as cloud, right? It could have that studio backdrop. Mm -hmm. um, but to put it on location does, of course, do something different. So then I'm just wondering if you could speak a little bit about how you navigate um, those choices. Mm. Um, well, uh, first of all, I'll just say that um, the, the big roundy thing is um, a, a, a huge piece of um, panda material, panda film that I sourced down in Almeria. So. I went to a few um, intensively farm places. One of this, this one was in Southern Spain and it's got, I think 30 kilometers of um, um, indoor greenhouses that grow vegetables, mostly tomatoes, but all kinds of vegetables as well. And, and this was on, on like a pile of, um, of um, rubbish uh, at the side of the road. That, that, so I took it with, back with me to Ireland and um, I kind of made this um, frame, I don't know if you can see it in the image or not, but I kind of made this um, little uh, frame to that, that was sort of a, a little, a, could make this kind of circular shape. And the field is actually right beside my house where, where I am right now, because we're surrounded by agriculture here, which is why this is all I hear it's all about agriculture. But um, so because the Panda film is an indoor, thing that was that was made to grow indoor food I wanted to take it into an outdoor environment to um yeah to just have that indoor outdoor conversation about like again 
if we, you know, if we do do, if we do change the way that um, we decide to um, manufacture our, our food, or if we do split, uh, you know, do some gene editing on our food, you know, and we can um, change the way that it grows. That means we can have like more urban spaces to grow our food, then and then there'll be less transport and all of that. It's a whole plethora of like, you know, problems around food, food production really. So that's, but that's what that's all about. It's about indoor and outdoor, your choice of like how you want your food to grow. I also just want everyone to realize that she brought this large piece of plastic back with her from her visit to Spain to Ireland. Um, airports and planes will come up for us in a moment, but it's just an amusing image I have of like you sort of sourcing these plastics from around the world and stuffing them into your suitcase. And anyway, yeah. we'll get back to this. Interesting <laughs> when I get stopped and the people look in my bags and, you know, yeah, <laughs> they're like, but, yeah. Um, if we could look at the next image, I wanted to make sure we had an installation shot because these images are actually um, much bigger than we necessarily realize when we're looking at them digitally. And um, there is a book, um, which is right here, right? And so it's a, the book is a little bit bigger than my head, right? So it's that sort of classic portrait size. Um, and the images across the book are mostly the same size, not entirely, but sort of, it does this thing for us, especially because we are sort of thinking about technology and the influence technology has for us of how we start to interact with images as if they were all the same, right? They all had the same proportions, they all have the same dimensions, they all have the same um, information carrying quality. Uh, and it really is only in sort of going to look at them and person, um, as I was able to do uh, at the Shaman Gallery on 24th Street, to get us realize, actually, these are much bigger than we might realize. And so you sort of sort of see here um, the size that they have, both in terms of in relation to the room, but to the person. And I'll just have everyone note for a moment, if you look towards the back on the left, um, there's two images, and then there's one on that uh, back wall right next to the pole, um, there's also small images. And that doesn't come across when we're looking at them in a slide or we're looking at them online. And so um, I, I, I bring this up because I think it's really important, especially with some of the next questions I have to remember the sort of the physical quality of these photographs as well. Um, if we could go to the next slide. Um, that image that you, I pointed out to you on the uh, to the left of that white pole in the installation shot is the one on the right. And the one, the other larger size ones are the one we see here on the left, Chimera. And I, I'm offering this proportion shot because this is really how differently sized they are in relationship to each other. And as we go through the rest of the slide set, I'll, I'll try and bring up for the audience's sake, this sort of something about size because I think it pr produces such a different experience. Um, I know you mentioned to me that you typically do work in this sort of larger size, like Chimera here in the white. Um, but how do you choose sometimes which ones should be which size? Um, yeah, well, I think a, a lot of the works have, um, I think Aidan Dunn, um, when he was writing about it and for the book, he, he called them um, um, photo sculptures. And I, I really, um, I, I really don't think of them as portraits. I do think of them more as being like pieces of sculpture, even if there's like a life person underneath it all. Um, so I suppose, I suppose in, in that way, you know, if you, sculpture can be, can be any size, right? You can do like small pieces, you can do big pieces. It's kind of like, however you kind of feel that they're, um, that they can sort of, um, look right that they that they they have the significance that you want them to have so sometimes images they can't be too big um they can always they can always be too small but sometimes they don't always have to be too big so um so with something like this especially like this chimera one which is the image on the, on the left hand side you know um it's basically you know it's basically a block it's just a shape and, and it's a form and it's a block and 
it's um so you, you know i just thought it would be great to do it in, in a bigger do it in a kind of a bigger size yeah, yeah. I, mean, I think it was yeah I, say, yeah, I think I think it was um I think I think it was you know Gursky or or um maybe it was Jeff Wall or one of those guys that you know I, and it's the digital age and everything as well that means that you know we you can you can make photography kind of any size but it's all about um choosing the right size for your images really yeah, in this case, one of the other things I'll just point out is in the first room of the gallery, um, many of the images, it, it is, it, many of the images do sort of focus around having some sort of figure element of it, they're not all. Um, it's interesting because in the first room where there are images, all the faces are covered like many of the th things we've seen, um, but you do get this sort of creeping a hand or hair or a little bit of uh, skin. And I mention it because, of course, it's this sort of interesting thing that happens in relationship to this sort of subsuming with the plastics, which is in the context of, uh, you know, medical and health, um, hair, right, a little bit of skin becomes what is potentially the problem, right? It is the thing that makes something uh, not pristine and not, uh, I'm blanking on the word right now. Yeah. And then in, the, in the second room where, where things get a little bit darker, uh, there's very, you get very little of that sort of natural element. And it's interesting that sort of the hair, the skin, those things that we think of as being natural suddenly become the things that are the most dangerous in this one context and the mm. way that that's being played with. Mm. Um, well, that's the human element, you know, and if you're dealing with, with modern issues and especially, you know, if I think back again to, you know, when I, in 2014, when I was in Liberia, you know, human contact and, and how, and your your skin and your hair it was just that was that was the danger zone you know and um when i i used to watch doctors who had been into the wards i i never went into those wards but i was on on the outside looking in but when you see the doctors um coming out and they had this whole ritual about how they took off their ppe you know, layer after layer, you know, and you roll this bit down and you take that bit off and then you, you know, it was kind of like a, a prayer in a way. I mean, it was the most incredible, that was the most dangerous part of the whole process of visiting patients, you know. Um, and so you, you began to realize that, you know, I mean, even to the point where, you know, some some people would with gaffers tape, you know, they, they would have elasticated um, masks and then they'd have shields on the top and then they would have respirate the whole thing and they'd still gaffer tape like around their masks you know so it, it, it you were really literally completely insulated with not no hair no skin like nothing showing whatsoever and I think that you know hair and skin I thought I think it was really important to show some of that in these pictures one because it's so human you know and it, and it, it is so human and I didn't want the hair and all that to be too tidy or too pristine. It just was what it is. That was part of the process, you know. It was like, I didn't want the materials to be like too pristine. I didn't want them to look like they'd been worked on too long. It's more like this, is, you know, the whole idea from the very beginning, um, like in 2014, when I started to work on the sculpture, you know, I'd work for like a week or 10 days down in the studio and, I take pictures of everything. And so I have this kind of photographic sketchbook of, of all the, the process that I went through. And the more that I tried to like tidy things up and put it in a box, the less I sort of believed it, you know. I, and I, so that's why I kept everything kind of um, chaotic in a way. Yeah, and I think that's it's important. Like, that seems like a good moment to go to the next image. Um, this is Weeds too, And again, this is one of, I mean, what I'm gonna say next really comes from having had the opportunity to see these pictures in person. Um, this is a photograph that sort of surprised me when I was standing right next to it, looking at it. Um, what you can't tell uh, from looking at this image online is that 
it's not even that it's quite blurry, it's almost pixelated. Um, and this was so striking to me that I started going around to all the images with my nose sort of pressed up against the glass, you know, like scanning the scene. And I just started to notice how um, across many of the images, in fact, you, uh, and what I should say across many of the photographs, because these were specifically, these were prints, there was something unusual going on with your focal choices, with some of the blur blurring. And I, I just was hoping that you would speak to us about letting that happen. Mm. Uh, well, actually, what the, this photo was one of those images. It was uh, it was an early one taken in 2014, and it was um, part of that sketchbook that I was talking about. It was really a snapshot, you know. Um, so the light is just like warehousey. It's just studio. It's just studio light, you know. Um, and the thing, the thing above it, I was I was trying different kind of lighting installation -y kind of things. It's just a tube of fluorescent light. Um, so when when we went to print it up, you know, when we were looking at the files, um, um, somebody pointed out to me. They said, "Oh, it's like the lighting. So you've got nothing in your blacks. You know, it's like there's nothing there in your dark tones. You know, you've got you've got a check you've got to reshoot it you've got to reshoot it so I looked at it and I just thought no I, I really like it that the way it is I think there's like it's authentic it's part of the process and it's part of what it is um and I I, actually, I remember I was doing a, a lecture in um in um a few years ago I think it was in Newport University speaking to some students and and one of them asked me they said oh we have to learn about a uh, plate camera photography and learn how to use an eight by ten and a four by five and it's pointless because i don't want to use it what you think and i said well it's always handy to have technical knowledge because you never know down the the line you know when you might want to use it it might you know you might want to use it as uh, to, to achieve something that that you're that you're seeing technically um but at the end of the day, you know, it really doesn't matter. Um, you can use like a photocopier, you know, you can use a biscuit tin with a hole in it, you know, to whatever it takes to get your vision across. And so for me, that was important to leave that as it is, because I'm not looking for, I'm looking for um, something that is really coming from me. It's part of my process. It's authentic. You know, it's, you know, I think that we're flooded, we're swamped, we're swimming in images with like, you know, mobile phones and social media and the way that we process images now is so quick and it's just so, people have got so good at reading images, you know, and assessing them and not only assessing how they look and the content, but what they mean. And I just kind of think that there's so much imagery out there that, you know, doesn't really mean that much. I mean, I'm not saying mine does, you know, but I'm just trying to say that I'm, I just want to um, stick to my own process, even that if, even if it does have, you know, some pixelation um, in, in the darker areas and things like that, because that's what it was. That's the moment that that was in it. Do you know, do you know what I mean? And I think that I mean, I've done, I've done, I've done a couple of series before that I've never published, and I remember one of them. Um, I took it to a very good friend of mine who is, who's a brilliant critic, and he said, "Well, the images are great, you know, um, great colors and great, and you know, but you know, it's really hard to care about. You know, I don't want to invest myself in it because there's nothing really there. So I think that that's really. Ever since then, I've really just thought, okay, this is the way I do things, this is the way it is, and that's the way it's going to be. And so that's why <laughs> I didn't reshoot really it. That's the long answer of why I didn't reshoot really it. Yeah. And I think it's also really important because I mean, speaking to the, I mean, this idea of like not having everything be perfect, right? And this very kind of glossy aesthetic that's emerged out of the type of perfection you can achieve with digital means, right? You can really, you can go across an 
any image with an extraordinary detail so that there is nothing that isn't as sharp as sharp can be with, you know, the color and the shadows and the contrast, like at every level. So it's this interesting thing because photography, of course, is so associated with this shift into the digital to have these photographs resist that, right? And to have them fight against, um, you know, as in with this triptych, which I wanted to, you know, talk to you about, like, what, a, what an unusual triptych, right? And like, why would you pick a triptych, um, especially of a, of, a, of a seeming topic that isn't a triptych topic, right? Like, I mean, right. <laughs> So how did, uh, how did this, this is Reservoir, right? Mm -hmm. um, how did this come to be? Um, well, I, I love painting and I love um, all kinds of painting um, and I love Francis Bacon and, and he's sort of a hero of mine. And um, so, you know, I, and I love the idea that there's kind of like a narrative in pictures. Um, it, it's great. I'm lucky, you know, because I, I can do books, which is great. Um, but then I also have, you know, the opportunity to, show the photographs on a gallery wall, which is a whole nother way of looking at photographs, which I think it's really important. And going back to the previous picture, I think it's really important that, you know, you do see do it, see an image as a photograph it was, if it was made as a photograph. Yeah, um, so the reservoir, the reservoir thing is more kind of about how, um, <laughs> it's the awfulness of it really. Um, it's a, it's a, um, it's a water, it's, it's an irrigation, it's a huge, huge irrigation tank that I found in Almeria in southern Spain, you know, as, as, as part of the outdoors, it was in during, uh, you know, in, in between all the outdoor um, greenhouses. And it, it looked to me so sort of apocalyptic and so depressing <laughs> and, and um, so awful and that the only little um area of hope that we had was because some the, the green was green um all the algae on top that um yeah i just kind of thought um it's more than it's more than one image you know it's it's got to be more than one image it's, it's a big conversation than that you know so that's why that's why and i, and I love photographs that, that work as a narrative as well that's why i love doing books you know because you can sort of if we can go to the next image, Sky, I mean, I think it's interesting the way in which um, your triptychs and then some of the diptychs that we'll get a chance to look at, um, because of the narrative quality of, of this, this format of the triptych or so forth, um, one does feel compelled to produce a narrative and to think through perhaps in greater depth what one doesn't normally think of as something one should stop and think about, right? Um, here, if I remember correctly, it's the self, it's this adhesive that gets put on windows, right? That is a part of what you started noticing. Um, I think this is taken from a plane, like a plane window? It's in a, it's in a departure lounge in an airport, yeah. So, yeah, I, I, you know, airports is one of those funny public spaces that is kind of like a no space space. It's um, it's got a, it's got a use. But um, the moment that you sort of walk in there, you know, you sort of for obvious reasons, you know, you really have to give up all your your individual rights, you know, um, and that's OK. But the more you look around you and the more that you see, more the more you can see how even that the what what you're looking at is controlled so um if you get into a bus and go to get onto your plane or if you're in some departure lounge looking at say you know if you go up to the window a lot of them have this sort of self adhesive stuff on the windows that changes your perception of what you actually see outside so um you know it was it was an evening it was it was really it was beginning to rain it was stormy and uh, I was going over to take to take a picture of the clouds on my phone. And as I got closer, I noticed there the, were all these lines and I got closer and closer and more and more lines. And, and that was really started me off on um, what you see as a part, you know, as a part of from what, what you kind of think you see. And there's all these kinds of layers um, that put between you and, and, and sort of your vision. 
um, of, of what you what you what you kind of think you see. You know, I mean, um, yeah, I mean, the way the way that we see, I mean, you're seeing with your brain. You know, you're you're not seeing with your eyeballs. You're looking with your brain, and you, um, you know, we're really smart in the way that we process all that information you know, digital comes along and, you know, it gives us a whole new way of, of looking at things because it's really, it's too much information. There's like, there's too much to process. There's too much going on. It's, it, it's like, it's too, it's, it's too sharp. It's too, you know, um, but then on the other hand, you know, you've got, you've got, you've got this, you know, which stops us from seeing what reality really is. So, and it's yeah. interesting because I think in airports, I often have the experience of it's as if I'm trying not to look places. Thank you. Yes. I mean, this is, <laughs> you know, it's as if in part because of how much surveillance occurs, right? It's as if I know, I know because I'm being watched, it's mm. as if I don't want to see, yeah. right? And mm. it's this kind of not this moving and looking without seeing that starts to happen mm -hmm. right um yeah. you're only looking for your gate you're only trying to you know it's it's, mm. it's sort of narrowing um yeah. and the windows themselves mm. have this sort of element mm. it's also interesting because of course airports are this huge connecting thing right i mean mm -hmm. it's they've been these places of opportunity for so many people they've been the mm -hmm. means that people go and create amazing lives it's been some of the good ways in which the world has been able to connect and mm -hmm. expand. Um, but across these images, and then, um, in fact, in the next one too, there's all you also. I, I was reminded, right? It's also another place that is seemingly made of plastic, right? Just like it's mm -hmm. everywhere. It's just like mm -hmm. it, it is its very own plastic self, mm -hmm. um, with plastic bins and plastic expanding walkways and plastic tins to take things I mean it's just <laughs> yeah um, but then mm -hmm. in this image on top of that and so I really I need you to up walk first of all you call this image IMGP 2964 right yeah. I mean it could not be a more distancing name mm -hmm. that you give it and it is an image of also uh, it's a, a of, of a computer screen right mm -hmm. it's and can how yeah. did, how did that be like why did you start taking photos then mm. of computer screens and of other photographs mm. yeah I, I mean um well one I wanted to see what it looked like in the words of Eggleston you know I, I wanted to see <laughs> like if it was if it could work but it's more kind of like the separation that we like have from reality and it's um and it's the way that um a photograph of a photograph is it really a photograph anymore you know it's like does the meaning of the photograph change when it becomes it's a photograph of something on a computer screen and is it real or is it fake um is it something that you can trust or something that you that that you know you should just um, ne never trust at all you know i mean most of, of what we see what you know most of the news that we see in life a lot of the images that we see are on a computer screen. I mean, we don't really buy, buy books and magazines that much anymore. So, you know, our whole life is coming through our screen. Um, so, you know, what level of trust are you begin to, are you going to put on that? Um, and um, so, that's why I decided to try to do images like that to kind of address that. You know, um, and then you've got like your airport is on the is on the right. Um, which is kind of sinister. I mean, I, you know, I think that airports are kind of sinister. Um, they, they don't leave you with an easy feeling. Um, and then on the left, you've got that bucket like full of junk, you know, that somebody is going to like freight over to the other side of the world and use, you know, um, use up like so much you know, carbon to do it. And to, so much petrol to do it and what's the point of doing that you know so again it's just like a question it's, it's a it's a question about air freight and it's a it's a question about you know all the useless junk we have in our lives and and 
I, I guess that was a low point when I was doing that, when I was doing that. Yeah, but um, yeah, I just wanted to address those issues really. Yeah, I mean, it, it's really, it, it's quite a disturbing, I mean, the longer you sit with this image and a couple others like it, it, it does become quite disturbing. And then there's this next image, which is in some ways far simpler. It is, it, it's a photograph you took yourself, but it's deeply distressing. Um, both the color I found very uh, uncomfortable um, no doubt there's a six-year-old out there who's telling me I'm wrong, but like I found the <laughs> color really uncomfortable. Mm. And then it's, it, this is an underground farm, yes? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so it is actually an underground farm. So um, these guys decided that they wanted to, in London, they decided they, they wanted to grow micro herbs and um, they couldn't find any space, affordable space in London. So they went to the underground people who run the underground the metro you know the trains that go the in the city and they asked the uh, london underground if they had any spaces that they weren't using underground and they they did they did so um it's really creepy you know you go in and then you go down these huge little spiral staircase you go down and down and down and you just come to this kind of huge tunnel -y thing and it's all black and dark and then they've sort of covered everything in this um, uh, sort of po polypropylene kind of white material and put stainless steel trays in there. And, you know, with all their like irrigation systems and their artificial lights, LED lights, and they're growing micro herbs under, underground. And I, I, I just, I thought it was great. You know, that I mean, some, na nature is amazing. Nature is like so resilient. You can grow, that you can go down there and grow things like that. And um, it tasted good, you know, <laughs> but it was just another, it was just a different way of, of looking at the future of food, really. Yeah, I mean, I have to say it's, it, it's remarkable how, I mean, from the airports to the tube, right, to the, you know, the subway, having these extra spaces to bring us back to land that is not being used it might not be land in the sense of like soil and trees but it's a space that can be used to grow things I mean it starts one of the things that starts to happen is these spaces open up across layers of meaning in ways that are too complicated to condemn right I mean there's the part mm -hmm. of me that can't help but think oh my gosh but think of all the electricity they're using and and then at the same time, but what a fantastic use of space and what a way to produce, you know, organic microgreens mm -hmm. in the otherwise empty underground space that is being left to fall apart. It's it's uh, true. I mean, I know I know what you're saying about all the electricity and all that that sort of thing, but if you think about the carbon footprint that bringing in like um, fresh fruit or I mean most i mean things like asparagus fresh fruit they're all if they're brought in by plane you know they have a huge i mean it's just massive yeah uh, carbon footprint if you buy something if you send it by ship it's much much better but if you buy something locally it's zero it's fantastic so there's a payoff there yeah. and that's actually what brings us i mean th this these two images that we'll look at next are for me some of the most distressing um not least because you are there, I mean, the plastic trays you put these photographs in, are they, what, what was happening here? I mean, this kind of, again, it's a photograph of a photograph where you put the photograph in these, it's almost like a food tray. Yeah. In. Well, it's, it's really just addressing, I mean, um, it's addressing uh, the relationship that, that we have with animals really. And um, it's really, it, I think the world is really divided, um, especially in agriculture where um, animals can um, be seen as, you know, um, just a product that is going to be harvested at some point. Um, it's, it's different for somebody like me, you know, I've owned animals, you know, my whole life. So I have different kind of relationship and I certainly, I don't like to eat them but, um, because I, I know from my own experience with animals that that's problematic for me, but that's just my personal choice. Other people have different choices. I understand that, but 
Um, recently, there was a there was an incident in Ireland where um, uh, animal rights organisation, animal welfare, I think it was organisation, put up a couple of uh, billboards, and um, one of them was um, I think it was a sheep being slaughtered or a lamb being slaughtered, and um, there was a huge outcry over here about that because um, they said that you know it was traumatising people, it was traumatising, especially it was traumatising children. And I understand that it's really, it's really, it's really scary for kids to see that, but um, it's much worse for the animal, you know, <laughs> it's like, um, it's, if we don't think about something, it doesn't mean to say that it's not there. Mm -hmm. um, if we don't think about it, it doesn't mean to say that it's all going to go away and everything's going to be okay. I mean, um, look at what's happening with uh, Black Lives Matter. Yeah, you know, those problems have been there. They've been systemic problems that have been going on for hundreds of years. And now people are just beginning to talk about it and thinking that it's a new thing. It's not a new thing. It's been going on and on and on. And so it's it, we really have to start like really taking personal responsibility, I think, going forward. I mean, it's just my personal opinion, you know, that maybe we should think about the impact that we're having on all the things that we have in our lives and all the things around us. So this is really about like, most meat is packaged in, in dark um, plastic, um, either purple or black plastic. Um, it degrades otherwise, and I'm not an expert, but it's something to do with that. So that's why um, I wanted to put this photograph. I actually went into an abattoir and took that picture. Um, that you see in there. And so I want to put it in the black plastic to start that conversation, really. Yeah. I mean, it also just speaks to the way in which, you know, because they're usually in packages, we don't think of them as what that photograph shows. Right. But it's just, it's a hunk of something, right? You know, maybe you know which part of the animal it came from, but perhaps not. Um, the next image, uh, hyena, um, I mean, hyenas are very scary. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, believe it or not, I mean, um, I, you know, when I was living in Zimbabwe, I spent a lot of time, you know, I was lucky enough to be able to go out to a, a lot of wild places. And um, what, I, what, what was amazing, it wasn't until I went to Botswana and uh, Botswana National Parks have a policy of, um, sharing space equally with all living creatures in in that area so um if as, as a human being you want to go into uh, into a national park it, you're going into the, their space into the animal space so you're not allowed to take weapons you're not allowed to take guns or flares or anything that will um uh scare scare the animals and it was the first place that i went where the wildlife was like so chilled out. I mean, they were they were really, really calm. Um, and I hadn't really, and I've been to a lot of other places and I hadn't really seen that before. And what was amazing was that, I mean, I'm not saying that wild animals aren't dangerous, I get it, you know, but what was amazing about being in those parks in Botswana was that if you respected the parameters, if you expected the limits and the space and, Everything's, everything was fine. I mean, we were there, we were camping there. There were like lion, there was everything around. There was nothing happened. People, it doesn't happen, you know, because it's the basic um, lack of understanding and lack of respect of, of the space that animals, you know, need. And, um, you know, I, I find it very hard to even like watch wildlife programs because I know how much um, the animals get, they, they, you know, it's not really criticism, but, you know, so to get good footage, you know, they'll stress the animals out. They'll, they'll, they, will, they will provoke them and stress them. And um, I mean, I'm not saying recent ones. I mean, there's some great programs, but it's very upsetting to see that because when you've got a little bit of knowledge about that, you know what that what that takes out of, um, you know, out of, out of the animals there. So this image was taken in um, a natural history museum in Bulawayo in Zimbabwe. Um, and um, it was kind of bizarre because the day before we'd been sort of like out um, looking at live animals and then we went to the National History Museum 
and it was full of like dead animals. And um, I just wondered if this was going to be one of the ways that, you know, we're going to be looking at wildlife, you know, going forward. I mean, I, I hope not. I really hope not. But, you know, I had the privilege of, um, of photographing uh, as David Attenborough. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, he's done an incredible amount of positive work for um, our education about, you know, the wild, wild well, the planet Earth, you know, and um, and I asked him, you know, is it all going to, you know, work out what you think? And he kind of, uh, he looked quite down and he shook his head. And I, I, I don't, I don't know how positive we can be about it, you know, because there's no political will to do anything about it, really. Um, I don't, I don't think so. I haven't seen any. I mean, anyway, I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to get myself into trouble. No, if no, I, keep I mean, talking I think about that. I, but, the thing. It, what you're bringing up is, I think, this thing that we face in many different arenas, which is that we are culpable, right? And we have, we are facing some of the horrors that even if we individually maybe don't feel responsible for, we are a part of just as, you know, a species and so forth, or as a nation, or whichever, depending on the issue. Um, but you know, even if he had to look down and shake his head, you know, even if we can't figure out that there's a solution that is actually like makes it all better, right? Mm -hmm. It doesn't remove the responsibility to still make the effort, right? That the responsibility doesn't lie in right. being successful, but in I, well, doing I, I, I absolutely agree with you. And we should all keep trying as, as much as we can, you know, to fight for things that we really believe in. Um, the problem comes when, you know, there's no um, accountability and the way that this, the system is working. I mean, if you look at, uh, if you look at like how um, the recent um, presidential campaign, you know, the, the, the last three in America, the last three presidencies, you know, there's been problems. People have used executive orders. So it's one executive order, then somebody else has done an executive and then somebody's undone that ex executive order. And um, I know that um, there have been complaints that, that, you know, there's no real power when you become president, there's no real power anymore. And, you know, there's no consensus about like anything about moving forward. It just is like, uh, it seems to be like a swinging backwards and forwards, backwards and forwards, like the whole time. Um, there doesn't seem to be any, you know, accountability, it, responsibility accountability for like these really big questions that are like going on you know it seems like the system is broken it seems like you know big business is never going to go away it's never going to pay its fair share it's like the you know the gulf between the rich and poor is always is, is going to grow wider and wider i i hope there's a solution i'm not i'm i'm not the smart person that can like work this out <laughs> you know i'm just an artist i can just um try and make work that asks these sorts of questions i mean this whole series is really about a collective trauma that i think that you know we're sort of like we're all kind of like feeling there's this, this is anxiousness it's like going forward um and it's just all about trying to make images that kind of address that you know yeah, I'm just thinking in the next image, mm -hmm. um, there's one of the things that I found. So the, that that everything you just said sort of came through for me in part in this image, the sense of drowning, it's called mm -hmm. paint. Mm -hmm. um, and the sense of drowning, the sense of how the protective layers themselves may not be protecting, um, but weighing us. Uh, when we were speaking earlier, you know, paint has so many toxins, right? Um, it's so easy to forget that the very walls that surround us can be emitting these um, these dangers, right? I mean, we know it obviously with lead paint because there's all these regulations around it. Um, they now think that arsenic and the wallpaper may have been the reason why um, people, you know, 150 years ago, when women were had to be indoors all the time, were had this type of experience where they were constantly faint and ill and so forth because they were breathing in all these arsenic fumes. So in paint, if we could just go back to the previous image, 
um, I was, I was wondering if, you know, for you, I mean, thinking about this and sort of the way in which it all starts to come, it starts to be so much with this one, how do you find breathing room? Mm -hmm. Just as um, a person even, not even as an artist, but like as a person, how do you find breathing room? How do I find? Breathing room, like how do you find the space? Oh. Well, I this this is the, this is a, one of the darkest images for me in the whole series because you know I I sort of saw her head as um, like the world as as the world and the, there's there's nothing alive on it um, and there's sort of only like a little bit of blood on the top of her head. It's really creepy and depressing. Um, but you know, thinking about the biggest issues that are facing us the, the planet today it is creepy and depressing there's no there's no two ways about it so you know that that's one way that I could try and express that and uh that that kind of thought that I had about where uh, about where we're going about you know um the death of the natural world um in the next image shark um you take some of that horror though, and you leave us on this edge, right? So um, with paint, it's this very distressing image. Um, shark doesn't seem that way. And then okay. it does, mm -hmm. right? And then you find yourself sort of like, sort of tilting back, seesawing back and forth between um, the, a kind of humor that's there and then um, and then the horror. And for me, of course, that has to do it, what how I think of it theoretically is the absurd and so forth. But it's just such a profound, I mean, it's just such a strong image for this entire body of work. Um, and I have endless things to say about this image, but in the interest of time and giving the audience a chance to ask you their questions, um, I'm wondering, Anya, if you can open it up to the Q&A. Yes, definitely. I'm happy to. Thank you so much for um, your, this conversation. And yeah, we have some great questions. Our first one comes from uh, Carolyn Bernstein. Um, and I'm going to turn on your mic. Oh, please feel free to read it for me. That's great. Thank okay. You. Thanks so much. Definitely. Um, so Carolyn asks, um, might you speak about how the forms are created in physical space. Um, and uh, I think this is, goes for more of the early works um, when we're thinking about, um, for example, wrapped. Um, I think this is one this question was asked. Um, the, the use of uh, posing or of um, cast sculpture, like using the human form um, as opposed to a cast um, and, and those choices that you make, yeah. Um, well, um, Carolyn, thanks very much for your question. Um, I um, yeah, it's it's a long it's a long process to kind of like realize what's going to work and what isn't going to work. So the first question that I have is um, about the materials. You know, the materials is really everything, and um, so it's about how um, um, I can form them, I can move them and make them into a kind of shape that kind of begins to say something about like what I'm trying to say, which is the, the premise of like this whole, um, this whole series. So um, in the case of Wrapped, I, you know, I mean, all, all through my travels, through, um, you know, this is before the pandemic, of course, you know, wherever I was in the world, I, I would always go looking for materials. I'd always go to DIY shops, supermarkets, and, um, I was in LA one day and somebody said to me, oh, do you know this is fantastic, fantastic um, fabric place down in so-and-so. So I went, I went there and um, it was like an Aladdin's cave of, um, of uh, the most amazing kinds of different kinds of materials. And so that's where I discovered the PVC and the latex and some of the uh, rubberized material and some of the meshes. And um, when I saw the pink PVC, I, I thought it looked like bubble gum, you know, and it took me all the way back to like when I was a kid and 
the big packs of bubble gum that we used to get. And it was kind of like, a, it, it sort of like, it was a cheery kind of thought. And then when I looked at the PVC, um, we started working with it. Um, that cheeriness kind of, that, that kind of left me quite quickly. Um, but it was a great material to work with. And um, it was, it was kind of like, um, yeah, it was because I wanted to kind of like show the, the body and the form of a human being underneath it. Um, the best way of doing that um, was to kind of scrunch somebody up. I mean, we tried standing kind of kind of different things, you know, but at the end of the day, that was what kind of like worked the best. Yeah. Thank you so much, Jackie. Um, our next question comes from G.E. Schwartz. And um, you should be able to turn on your mic now. Yes, hi. Um, been taken so much today with so many of these images in so many different directions. And, I, and, and, and it seems as though there's so many references. I had to write this down because there's so many things going on. With so many of the references, it seems like almost like altar pieces. And I was thinking of Ischenheim's Grunwald, uh, then, then moving on to ectoplasmic photos of the 19th century with some of these, these images and seemingly dead souls leaving your bodies, rising up to the data cloud. Um, it, it, I, I kept thinking, do you, do you often see your work at all as, uh, as documenting partitions between life and death itself? Um, no, not really. <laughs> I have to say, it's a great question. Nope. Nope. It's a great, great question. I mean, I suppose um, throughout all my work, um, I do have a big interest in um, human rights and individual rights and um you know, and, and who we are and where we, what, you know, where we've come from. Um, and um, yeah, a spirituality is, is part of us, you know, and, and um, whatever religion we are, and if, even if we're not religious at all, you know, um, there's always a feeling, there's a sixth sense, there's like something else going on, you know, and I think that that's just part of the essence of who we are as human beings, you know, so it's, it's probably, um evident in like in all my work I, I i wouldn't have said so much in this one i mean it's more evident when i'm sort of out in the real world taking pictures of real people because um i th i think that you know um the the you know that the way that people respond to you and the way that they they give give of themselves and sometimes you can like see that in the pictures you know that's like a I think that that's really that's sort of spiritual, you know, in the in the sort of in in the larger sense, you know. But for this series, um, the the metaphor was really more about sort of bigger political issues. Um, it wasn't really about bigger human issues, you know, that that, that we're sort of sharing. But um, no, but that's a really lovely thing to say. Thank you. <laughs> Well, thank you. There was so much in it that I think is on different levels. It's just apparent to me, but thank you. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. I love that question and then your comments throughout. Um, and thank you, Jackie. Our next question is uh, coming from Ryan Michaels, and you should be able to unmute. Mm -hmm. Hi. Uh, yeah, I just had a kind of a kind of a technical, technically oriented question. Um, I'm very taken with uh, kind of the textures and the tones and the colors in your images. And I was wondering um, how much of that would you say you kind of get with the light the day of? And how much of that would you say you kind of edit or tweak after the fact? And are there limits to how you digitally treat your images? Like, are there things you will not edit, you know? Um, uh, great question, great question. Um, yeah, so every series, um, yeah, it, it takes me ages, you know, to try and figure the things out really. And um, so every series, um, when, I, when I'm making the work, I'm constantly like assessing it. And um, it's about trying to get to a place that says what you want it to say and makes it easier to read for people to read to try and get the, uh, what, what you're kind of feeling so for so I, I will manipulate things yes and okay. we'll try and um 
make the series as uh, unified as, as possible to um, try and make it more accessible for people. And so, for example, my, my very first series that I did, um, I shot it in mostly in Zim and um, the, I decided to shoot it in direct sunlight because that's the place that I decided to shoot um, portraits in a workplace. And, um, and that, that's, that's when I could shoot it. And a lot of the times it was in the middle of the day with, 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 uh, with the direct sun. And luckily, and I was very lucky. And uh, um, a few years ago, I had the opportunity to meet um, Henri Cotier-Bresson before he died and his wife, Martine Franck. And um, he was telling us about, um, uh, he had a house in the South of France, um, practically next door to Matisse, the painter, who he was very friendly with him. And he told me a conversation Matisse had said to him that, you know, Henri, you're very, very lucky because you just shoot in black and white. You know, I have to deal with color. And as everyone knows, sunlight kills color. And, you know, I, so I thought back to this and I thought, well, if Matisse is saying that, it's got to be right, right? So um, I, I was out, and so I did manipulate the images. We tried to do it analog, uh, by analog, but in the dark room, but we just couldn't get, get, we could get rid of two colors, but not the third color. So we ended up doing that um, digitally. And then, for, so for each series, yeah, it's um, I do think about like how things will work together. Certain things that uh, I won't edit out. Um, anything is up for grabs, you know. I I wouldn't say no to anything. I want to open myself up to every possibility of of what how how I make an image. So there are really like no rules, you know. Um, sure. There are no rules, except when it comes to like real people. I mean, I would never like, you know, I'd never like betray their trust by doing something that I wouldn't be able to sleep with at night. Do you know what I mean? It's kind of like, you know, you um, tacitly go into this kind of agreement when, well, I, I do anyway, when I go into a situation with, with um, people who have agreed to have their photograph taken and you take on a kind of, you know, responsibility it's a give and take situation so um you're the bigger you're the, the you're the bigger part of the give and take because you're taking a lot more really than they're giving you've got a lot more you know um you've got a lot more that you can take from that situation but in return you know there are certain things that, that you shouldn't do so i would say in that situation no uh, i wouldn't but this you know and for this series you know everything everything was constructed and controlled and um you know built built to a concept so is that okay yeah. thank you <laughs> thank you ryan uh, our next question comes from tom mcglynn and uh you have the mic yes uh hi i'm really liking this conversation I, you know, when I, when I look at your images, I think you did mention humor, but maybe along those lines, I, I think about um, the way the discussion was introduced in terms of uh, what escapes our normal vision or what escapes our vision in a, like a typical situation. And I was wondering if you consider that uh, those things that escape our vision correlate with the unprocessed or the the imminent possibility of that versus the instance, uh, for instance, the end product or the overprocessed petroleum products. There's this process of like covering and uncovering, and it's it's almost like a humorous game. But to me, it also speaks to the potential for art to express the imminent without um, completely uncovering it. If that makes any sense. Yeah, yeah, no, no, no. Yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, it's uh, it, it's really about the, the, the challenge with this with this whole series was about making work that do, doesn't, it, making imagery of stuff that doesn't exist. So it's kind of like trying to illustrate the sort of consciousness of like a generation that we're all this whole experience that we're all kind of like going through this underlying feeling of the way that the world is going 
um, and um, the concerns like around it. Um, so how, how do you make how do you make images of that? How do you make images of, of a feeling of something that doesn't actually really exist? But you know that that that's going to impact on us, you know, in five years, in 10 years or something like that. You know that these are going to be re real significant problems that, that we're going to deal with. So how, how do you start that conversation? What kind of process are you going to are, are you going to engage in that? that begins to like address that. So when I'm talking about the seen and the unseen, um, it's really about, we, we, we think that we're in control. We think that, you know, we're in, in control of certain aspects of our life, but actually we're kind of, we're kind of not, you know, um, we think that we can control all our personal data and all of that. But I mean, goodness, I don't know how much of my personal data is out there. It's all out there from, you know, it's our whole lives are, are sort of the information about all our lives is sort of like owned and traded by by other people now. You know, I think that's something that's going to come to a reckoning. If you think about like something that doesn't exist right now is like the, you know, the inoculation, the injection, you know, the jab, the passport, the COVID passport um, so that we can travel. That's Okay, that's a great idea. That's great. That means it can keep us all safe. But at what point does somebody go, oh, you know what, we can put yellow fever on there and we can put all the other jabs on that passport as well. Do you know what else? Maybe we should put like, if you're HIV positive, maybe we should, ah, maybe we should put, if you've got like private healthcare and your level of private, you know, and it's kind of like this snowball of, um, if you give, if you make an app or you do something that helps to facilitate something, um, what I want to know is like, how are we going to begin to control that? Who's going to, who's going to look out for our interests? Who's going to look out for our interests in that? You know, so I think that all the unseen things that, um, all the unseen things that we don't necessarily think about every day, you know, um, that's what this series tries to address. I mean, most of my series address like one little thing, but <laughs> I suppose with this, I really went to town, you know, I was, I was just trying to think of it, capturing kind of like a moment in time. I think that uh, for me, the, the probably the most attractive aspect of your work is this, this kind of largesse to kind of an ambition to capture like an animus of, a, of, a, of an age of an epoch. So I don't necessarily find the, the work like didactically political. And I find that like a real relief because the delivery system gets to the nervous system, you know? And so I think, I think you're, you know, you're successful in trying to capture that spirit of the age, uh, but in a non uh, representational way, ironically. Thank you. Yeah, yeah I, I appreciate that because um, you know, I'm just like an ordinary artist. I'm just an ordinary person with concerns, and I, you know, <laughs> I um, I just have uh, I just have a passion for like making work, you know. But I don't, you know, no one person has all the answers. Um, I suppose, you know, traditionally, you know, I was always taught, well, there's two sides to every story. Well, you don't always, you know, in your personal life, you don't hear that's or that's something to hard to hold on to occasionally, but. You know, when you're looking at bigger issues like going forward, I think that you know there's positives and negatives in everything. And um, yeah, I mean, it's really just about starting the conversation. But you said some really lovely things to me. I, I really do. I really do appreciate that um, very much, honestly. Yeah. Great conversation and uh, great, great question, Charlotte. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tom, and thank you, Jackie. Um, I think that's the perfect note to close on. I mean, unfortunately, we do have to start winding down, but I, I, um, I, I loved uh, coming to a close on, on that question, so thank you. Um, so at the rail, uh, we have a tradition of ending our lunches with a poem, and uh, we've carried that into these community events. So today, I'm thrilled to welcome um, our Poet Laureate of the Day, uh, Jasmine Kaur to the stage. Jasmine Kaur is a writer, illustrator, and poet living in unceded solo First Nations territory. 
Her writing, which explores themes of feminism, womanhood, social justice, and love, acts as a means of healing and reclaiming identity. Her debut poetry and prose collection, When You Ask Me Where I'm Going, was shortlisted for the Goodreads Choice Awards, and her sophomore, sophomore novel, If I Tell You the Truth, was released on January 19th of 2021. She is currently an MFA student in the University of British Columbia's Creative Writing Program. So Jasmine, uh, the floor is yours. And thank you again, Jackie and Charlotte. Hello, I am so grateful to be here in this space today, closing out the event. Um, and I was just like listening and absorbing this beautiful conversation. Um, about Jackie's beautiful photography um, and all of like the real world implications of the work. And as I was listening, I was reflecting like and just laughing to myself about how the poems I happened to choose for today's reading coincide so perfectly with the subject matter that we explored. Um, we had this beautiful conversation about concealment um, and invisibility um, as we were talking about like COVID masks and, and plastic quite literally concealing an entire body and what it means to be navigating a world and and medical care when you can't see your doctor in front of you and and as i was looking at those images especially the one of of that body entirely concealed in opaque plastic i was thinking about what visibility means in my own life um, what hyper visibility means um, and how sometimes hyper visibility and invisibility are two sides of the same coin when you are a person of color, when you're a racialized person, um, when it feels like your body is constantly on display no matter where you are. Um, so the first poem that I'm going to share is from my first book, um, When You Asked Where I'm Going. And this is a poem that I wrote as I was reflecting on what it means for me when I leave my house, the safety of my own personal space and step out onto a street um, in a fairly conservative and sometimes very racist place um, where me simply being me and having a turban on my head means that people feel entitled to, to stare at, analyze, police, criticize, um, curse at my body sometimes. I was thinking about how the people who will see me um, and see my turban on my head um, and have a thousand different opinions about it, sometimes racist opinions, have those opinions because they can see me, but also because they can't see me. They see me as a body and they see me through the lens of like all of those invisible biases that they've built up throughout their life, but but they're not really seeing me as a human being. Um, so on that note, I'll just jump right into the poem. He tells me he doesn't care about politics and I am lost. I am a brown woman born on land stolen, sacrificed and then silenced. I am a brown woman born into a body that churns heads that only house glares. Glares that ask me to leave. Mouths that spit blood towards my kind. Hands and fists and forces that want to push me back to where I come from. While where I come from screams in ways that go unheard. Where I come from is buried under blistering earth and burning mines that are set aflame by a state that brings kerosene instead of water when my people are thirsty. Where I come from is being dug out of the dried soil by people young enough and old enough to demand more than justice from those who have tried and failed to crush them. He tells me he doesn't care about politics and I wonder if he can see the political boundaries on my body, the conflict zones between my shoulder blades, the border built between my tongue and me the partition carved into my palms, all the ways in which it is political for me to live. And I wanna share another very short piece from, from the first chapter of this book, which speaks to that idea that I just mentioned of, um, you know, when you're a racialized person, when you look a little different than what is decided upon as being normal, um, you kind of feel like a walking, object um, for you know public consumption and sometimes it feels almost as if you are you are something sitting in a museum um, and I think that women of color can definitely relate to that experience if you um, if you are visually different um, you can relate to that experience if you are um, a woman you can relate to that experience of being kind of objectified and policed um, as soon as you step into a public space um, and this was my my short reflection on what it means to to challenge that that idea that I am simply something sitting in a museum. 
in this body. I am a work of art that will face unsolicited critique. A wrong answer on a test that I never agreed to take. And a set of rules that have undoubtedly been broken. But I would be lying if I told you that this skin does not hold me close. Because in every shade of neon, their disdain and curiosity is drawn to me. And all the while, I glow. And my last piece just kind of speaks directly into that one. So I think I can jump right into it without an explanation. It's true. We were never welcome here. Those of us with sun showered skin and generations of rebellion dancing beneath our rib cages, not aching to make our struggles romantic nor to kiss the word exotic like a compliment, not simply searching for another way to say that our legs must stretch and tear to plant feet in two continents, but instead walking toward a justice that cannot be commodified, one that cannot be softened and sold back to us. So switching gears a little bit, I wanted to speak to a poem, um, especially because we are just past International Women's Day, um, that explores what it means to be navigating the world um, as a woman, a woman identified person or femme person, um, when women's bodies so much like, like I just described, um, are policed in such a way that we are made to feel that the world owns us. Um, and we internalize that ownership sometimes. Um, and it has terrible consequences um, for our psyches. Um, so this was my exploration of what it means to internalize, internalize that male gaze um, and the violence of it. They taught her that hell existed at the curve of her waist because the shape of her body left boys wanting, tempted them like, tempted them like apples hanging from trees, like fruit that wanted to be picked, made their minds wander, left too much to the imagination, too little to the imagination he taught her that hell existed in the hourglass of her being, in the small of her back, in the movement of her legs, when he hurt her, because the sin was too tempting. And she prayed for forgiveness. So with that, um, I will close out my reading. I want to say thank you so much for having me today. Um, and for allowing me to contribute to this beautiful conversation that we all got to participate in. Thank you so much, Jasmine. That was beautiful. It's an excellent way to, to close out this program. Um, and thank you, Jackie and Charlotte, um, for this conversation, for um, amazing questions and uh, for guiding us through the slides. And to all who ask questions and um, make comments in the chat. This has been a really wonderful um, program, so thank you. Um, so RAIL is a nonprofit organization, so if you enjoyed our event, please consider making a donation to keeping the RAIL and our special projects free, relevant, and independent. And you can join us tomorrow at 1 p.m. for a radical poetry reading with Ben Keating, featuring, featuring a political poetry read by Helix C. Armageddon, Barrow, Max Flagg, Billy Martin, David Mills, Jeffrey Cyphers Wright, Luca Scobie, and Fong Lee. And now I'm going to, you should be able to unmute yourselves to say goodbye and thank you. Bye, that was fantastic. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, so, thank much. you so much. That was amazing. Thank you, Charlotte. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It's been really wonderful. Thanks, Charlotte. Thanks, Jackie. Thanks. Amazing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jasmine. Thanks all the great questions. Thank you, Jackie. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Jasmine.